and welcome everybody to the Agronomist Ontario Diagnostic Days edition. This feels very, very strange doing the Agronomist on a, a Tuesday morning, but this is a special week because it is day one of Ontario Diagnostic Days. We did this last year as well. Very, very good partnership with our friends in Ontario. We're going to get to some of the sponsors here in a, in a second, but uh, we're going to cover some really, really important topics here today. we got two great guests in Peter Sycama and Mike Cobra. You know them well. They are full of insight, and we've got some great diagnostic videos to break down as well. So we usually do the Agronomist 8 o'clock Eastern on Monday nights, but it's a special 10 a.m. Eastern here on this Tuesday. So uh, let's not uh, go any further. Let's uh, get started with today's program. The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Grain Farmers of Ontario Agris Co-op BSF Canada Bear and DeKalb Corteva and Pioneer Great Lakes Grain Mazex The Mosaic Company Pride Seeds and Syngenta. If you want to participate in today's program and ask questions, we encourage you to do so because we are live here this morning. All you have to do is enter your comment to your question in the box, whether you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. It's very easy, and we'll get to as many of your questions as we possibly can throughout this next 60 minutes. So uh, let's start off by bringing in our, our first guest today, and it is Peter Sycama, University of Guelph, out of the Ridgetown campus. Peter, how are you? Doing well. Well, that that's good. You're, I'm, I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear. So, uh, Peter, today we're going to talk about water hemp. Uh, th- this is an issue of great significance. Uh, I hear a lot of frustrations from a lot of farmers about having to, to deal with this yield robber. Um, th- this problem has just grown uh, to the extent that uh, even someone like yourself, an expert, really, really never thought it, it would. Uh, you, you are correct, Sean. So the first glyphosate-resistant water hemp in Ontario was identified from seed collected in 2014. And all we knew at that time was that there was one field in southwestern in the southwestern corner of Lambton County with glyphosate-resistant water hemp. And in the seven growing seasons after that, water hemp is now found from Essex County in the southwest to uh, Leeds and Grenville County in the Ottawa Valley, spanning a distance of 700 kilometers. So this uh, weed biotype has moved 700 kilometers in seven growing seasons. Not only that, Uh, The water hemp that is present in Ontario, in the majority of those counties, it is uh, resistant to four different herbicide modes of action, the group two, five, nine, and 14 herbicides. Wow. Okay. Let, let, I want to stop you there. I don't want you to give too much away. Let, let's watch uh, this morning's first clip here on the Agronomist for Diagnostic Days and take a look at yourself out in the field. Here is uh, clip number one. Uh, Good afternoon. Here we are at a farm in Middlesex County. And here you can see the density of water hemp that some Ontario farmers are dealing with. So the first glyphosate resistant water hemp that we're aware of was from seed collected in 2014. All we knew in 2015 was that there was one farm in Ontario with glyphosate resistant water hemp, and it was in the southwest corner of Lambton County. Glyphosate resistant water hemp is now in 14 counties across Ontario from Essex County in the southwest 
to Leeds and Grenville County in the Ottawa Valley. So this weed has spread, spread more than 700 kilometers in six growing seasons. And I would have never predicted that water hemp would be found across such a large geographic area in six short years. Not only do we have glyphosate resistant water hemp in Ontario, there is now a four way resistance, resistance to the group two, five, nine and 14 herbicides in eight of those 14 counties. So that presents a huge challenge for Ontario farmers. So in terms of water hemp, the question is, is how did it get here and why is it an increasing problem? So if you look at uh, the water hemp that is on Walpole Island in the southwest corner of Lambton County, it's almost genetically identical to the water hemp that's been in Ontario for more than a century. However, something happened in the last 20 years it's mutated and it's adapted to our corn and soybean production systems. And as you can see here, it now infests commercial corn and soybean fields. Really interesting, the water hemp in, Missouri, in uh, Essex County is almost genetically identical to the water hemp in Missouri. So that raises a question. How did the water hemp from Missouri end up in Essex County? And in retrospect, nobody can say for sure. It possibly came in on contaminated forage seed. It could have come in on uh, contaminated livestock feed or it could have been moved with migratory birds. All as we know is that it's almost genetically identical to the water hemp in Missouri and it somehow ended up in Essex County. So in terms of the uh, competitiveness, uh, water hemp is not as competitive as glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane, giant ragweed or common ragweed in corn and soybean. In trials conducted in Ontario, the average yield loss due to glyphosate resistant water hemp interference in corn is 19%. However, in our most competitive environments, the yield loss can approach 100%, such as uh, this field here. And in terms of uh, soybean, the average yield loss due to glyphosate resistant water hemp interference is 43%. And once again, in our most competitive environments, it can approach 100% yield loss. So now I'd like to talk about control of glyphosate resistant water hemp in uh, soybean. So on my left, you can see the density that's occurring on this commercial farm in Middlesex County. And this is actually some research by a graduate student. Her name's Hannah Symington. Hannah's looking at the use of acetochlor warrant in soybean harnessing corn as a weed management tool in Ontario, and it's expected to be registered soon. In the work that Hannah's doing, she's looking at various tank mix partners with Warrant in soybean. And I'd really like to show the uh, control with uh, Warrant plus uh, Volterra. You can see this plot over here. It's near perfect control of the uh, glyphosate resistant water hemp on this farm. So uh, let's talk about different products and different strategies for managing glyphosate resistant water hemp in soybean. I think that every Ontario farmer that has this weed on their farm should plan a two pass program. What you want to do is you want to start with your best soil applied herbicide and then manage the escapes. So let's say in IP soybean, Roundup Ready soybean, you put down your soil applied herbicide and you could come back with reflex post-emergence. However, in this particular experiment, I want to look at the different management options in E3 soybean. So this happens to be boundary applied pre-emergence. And I think you'd agree with me, that is not commercially acceptable weed control. Now we'll move over three plots over here, and this happens to be Authority Supreme applied pre-emergence, and once again, that is not commercially acceptable. 
And uh, we'll move uh, three more plots over here. This happens to be fierce applied pre-emergence. And in our trials over the years, FIERCE has been the best setup program for glyphosate resistant water, hemp control and soybean. And so in 2021, we didn't get an activating rainfall and you can see that the control with FIERCE was quite disappointing. And in this uh, next setup program, this is an offer from BSF. Here we applied Zidua plus Sencor pre-emergence, and once again, disappointing control. So the point that I want to make is every farmer should start with his best setup program, and then he should plan for a post-emergence uh, herbicide if he has weed escapes, as you saw in these four treatments. So this happens to be an E3 soybean. This happens to be Zidua plus Sencor followed by Liberty applied post-emergence. And that would be 99% control. And in the last uh, plot over here, you can see it's uh, Zidua plus Sencor applied pre-emergence followed by Enlist Duo applied post-emergence. And that is greater than 99% control. So I think whether you're growing corn or soybean, your uh, weed control strategy should be similar. In both crops, start with your best soil applied uh, herbicide and then manage the weed escapes. In uh, corn, the group 27 herbicides are really good. So uh, soil applied programs like Acuron, Acuron Flexi, Converge, Applied uh, Pre are a really good foundation. If you use a group 27 soil applied, I think coming back with Liberty post-emergence is a really good strategy. Conversely, you could use a non-group 27 pre, something like Integrity, and then come back with a group 27 herbicide, something like Callisto, Shieldex, Acuron, post-emergence, Lotus, and you will have near perfect control of glyphosate resistant water hemp in corn. Thank you very much. I, Peter, I love that we're not commercially acceptable. <laughs> I, I like that. Okay, so you know, as I look at those plots as you're walking through, you know, one thing that really hit home with me is that it's it's not like a it's not a one or the other in terms of the soil residue herb soil the residue herbicide versus the in crop. It's really a combination of the both. You you just you have to have that it's not plan A and plan B, but it's it's really a solid two-way plan to control something like water hemp. I uh, completely agree, uh, Sean. I think with the uh, soil applied herbicides, sometimes that's all you need, right? And if you put down a really effective soil applied herbicide, and I like using the term, you manage the weed escapes. If there are no weed escapes, you don't need a post-emergence herbicide. However, in many seasons, because of the density, the emergence pattern of water hemp, uh, weather patterns, we do get a late flush of water hemp. And then you can manage those escapes with a post-emergence herbicide. And I would say that that's the strategy for both corn as well as uh, soybean. Now, in a year where we think it's going to be dry, do, do we would it be foolish to make the decision not to use the residue herbicide and just go with in-crop or like, how, how does that decision break down for yourself? Yeah, I think if you look at a long-term horizon, if you look at a farm profitability over a 10 year period, I think you maximize farm profitability with the use of two pass weed control programs in corn, soybean and dry beans. When you're planning your weed control program on March 15, you do not know what the weather will be on May 1st. You don't know the density of the water hemp. You don't know the time of emergence of water hemp. And because it uh, has an extended emergence pattern, because it occurs at high densities in the province, I think you have to start with your best soil applied herbicide. Even if you don't get an activating rainfall, you're going to reduce that density by 
50 to 90 percent, even if you don't get that activating rainfall. And if you don't, you're for sure going to have to apply a post-emergence herbicide. I do want to stress what I said earlier. In some environments where we have low density, we don't have a lot of late emerging water hemp, and you get an activating rainfall, all you need is your uh, soil applied herbicide, and it will carry you right through till harvest time. I want to mention to everybody that uh, if you do have a question for Peter, please enter it in the box, whether you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. And we will have time at the back end to answer some of your questions as well. And you do see at the bottom of the screen there, you can apply for CU credits by going to the URL that uh, is below there. So, um, Peter, h how close are we to not having a herbicide option for something like water hemp? Um, and if, if it is on the horizon... If things don't change, then what? Yeah, I think Ontario farmers will continue to use herbicides as part of their water hemp management program. However, I think uh, farmers will need to become more proactive. I think they'll need to develop long-term crop slash weed management programs and reduce the over-reliance uh, in weed control on a single herbicide mode of action. So uh, what we've done on two commercial farms in Ontario, we have set up nine-year experiments where we're looking at anything from continuous soybean with the only herbicide applied is glyphosate to a three-crop rotation of uh, corn, soybean, wheat. We have seven different uh, effective modes of action We've reduced the soybean row width. Uh, we've increased the seeding density. We plant cover crops after winter wheat combining. And really interesting, at one of those locations, after one cycle of a three-year crop rotation, we reduced the number of water hemp seeds in the seed bank from 165 million seeds per acre to 30 million seeds per acre, or an 82% uh, reduction. So based on the work that uh, we've done, and that's on farms with four-way resistant water hemp, I do think that uh, herbicides will remain a component of your long-term weed management strategy, but I think it will be in, uh, complemented by very uh, many other weed management tactics. Okay, Peter, quickly here before we move on to uh... Mike Cobra question here, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the uh, active, but uh, was the first active that you showed in the plot was that you you, you can try? Uh, you probably know how to pronounce that. Yeah, and so a uh, very fair uh, question. It, it is acetochlor, and acetochlor has been registered in the United States for many years. It has never been registered in Canada up to this uh, point. It is available from uh, Bayer Crop Science, and uh, the formulation that's used in soybean is will be uh, sold under the trade name of Warrant, and the formulation in corn is Harness. Warrant. There's a warrant for your water hemp arrest. Okay, uh, Peter, that was great. Thank you very much. Of course, you're coming back. We've got you for clip number three here, as well as the general questions at the end. So uh, appreciate it very, very much, and, and great uh, Ontario Diagnostic Days video. Okay, let's, uh, we're going to bring me back here and let's bring in our next panelist. I just mentioned him. He is Mike Cobra. Mike, how's it going? I'm doing well yourself. Uh, good. Okay, we're going to look at herbicide injury here as it pertains to, to soybeans. And I, I really love this clip because uh, you get into the canopy and show us up uh, close and personal uh, how, how this can impact the crop. Um, how, how big of an issue is this on a year-to-year -year basis for, for growers? I mean, certainly, I, I think to take the, the big perspective, uh, when, when these products are brought to market, uh, the registrant has to demonstrate uh, an acceptable level of crop safety and, and no reduction in yield at, at twice the labeled rate. So, you know, inherently, there's a lot of good crop safety with these products. But but every year we do see um, herbicide injury and it's often compounded or, or there's other factors that maybe um, cause it. Sometimes it's just bad luck in terms of an untimely rain at the wrong time. But more and more we're seeing, 
you know, additional stresses that uh, maybe show the injury where maybe normally it wouldn't, wouldn't have occurred. So compaction or, you know, uh, a bit of carryover from another herbicide. So, you know, every year we do see some level of herbicide injury. It's from a diagnostic perspective, it's trying to evaluate, is this injury that I need to be concerned about uh, from a yield perspective um, or, or is it just uh, cosmetic? Well, I, I love visuals, so let's take a look at the clip. Uh, great job by yourself putting it together. Let's have a look at clip number two with Mike Cobra. Here are soybeans at the unifoliate stage uh, after uh, soil applied herbicide was put down probably close to three weeks ago. And this has been sprayed with a group 14 herbicide, so things like Valterra and Authority. And here we're seeing the injury that you sometimes can see with those herbicides. When you get a rainfall just as the hypocotyl is coming uh, above ground, it'll take up more product. It could be rate as well, but you see that growth is kind of burnt off. Um, in this case, I'm optimistic that the auxiliary buds will kind of branch out and produce new growth. So we'll come back in a week and see. Uh, most plants are unaffected, but we see here are some plants that, that clearly are. Probably 5% of the stand is affected. So we'll come back and take a look. But that's a uh, kind of typical group 14 soil applied injury is again, that uh, uh, increased uptake of the herbicide causing some damage on the new shoots and in, in severe cases will uh, die but in this case I think we have some reason for optimism the auxiliary buds look like they're going to uh, branch out. So we actually looked at these plants last week the um, they were at the unifoliate stage the growing point seemed to be kind of burned off a little bit and I assumed that we'd see axillary growth and that's what we're seeing now seven days later is is we are seeing sh shoots coming out from the axillary buds there which is a positive sign although there's quite a bit of leaf distortion on those newer leaves and these plants here looked really uh, healthy last week and since then we're seeing a lot more leaf distortion and in some spots uh, a little bit of stunting and so we've had a good amount of rainfall in the previous week and so this is a good thing for weed control you can see here we have perfect weed control but uh, we also have then soybean plants that will take up more products through the roots and uh, and as such we see a lot more leaf distortion and in the extreme cases here some some significant stunting so this mixture here is of a group 14 and group 15 herbicides. So things like dual frontier or Zidua mixed with um, group 14 herbicides like Valterra or Authority. And sometimes when you mix those two products together, you can see uh, severe injury like this. I would assume if we come back in a week to two weeks, uh, they will uh, grow out of this, although the leaf distortion will still be on those trifoliate leaves. So again, looking at things this week, let's look at our unsprayed soybean plants. They're about nine inches tall in general. They have about four trifoliate leaves on them. The trifoliate leaves for the most part look healthy, although you'll see the odd one there with a little bit of distortion. Not a lot. The lower unifoliate leaves have probably what is some sort of UV damage or environmental-like uh, injury. Now, we've sent samples away to look at disease, but I, I think it probably is just environmental. So let's look at our treated areas. So these are the most severely affected plants from the previous weeks where we actually thought they were going to die but there has been regrowth from the axillary buds you can see they're severely stunted though you almost a third of the height of our unsprayed area they do though interestingly enough 
have four trifoliate leaves, albeit each one is has severe leaf distortion. But you can see there, that's the point at which the da herbicide damage was the greatest, and it has shooted out those axillary buds and new growth, but not without a penalty to top growth. Now these are plants sprayed with that group 14-15 combo that are probably more representative of uh, injury where we do see some trifoliate leaf distortion. And we do notice some stunting, right? It's more the plants are in kind of that five to six inch height as opposed to eight or nine inch height. So not as uh, dramatic of injuries, but, but nonetheless injury that has affected uh, top growth, although at the end of the day we still have four trifoliate leaves. So with respect to these three different areas, right, severely affected, more typically affected like we're seeing here, and then the unsprayed, all the soybean plants actually have, or at the same physiological stage, fourth trifoliate, they're just at varying degrees of, of uh, injury above ground. So we'll see how that plays out throughout the duration of the se season and how that affects yield. A weed control is still excellent in these plots. So you might look at this type of injury and say, how do you mitigate it? Because ultimately that's the whole value in being able to diagnose herbicide injury is, is to learn from it, to, to try to avoid seeing it in the future. So we know that combinations of group 14 and group 15 herbicides are just, uh, they're hotter they have the potential to cause greater levels of crop injury. So the reality is with a lot of the problem weeds that we have, especially in, in IP soybeans, we, we do need those two modes of action. So things that you can do to mitigate the risk is, is one, you look at soil type. Clearly this, the effects of this injury are gonna be more readily seen on soils that are lower in organic matter and that are coarse. And so fields like that should be avoided um, and then ultimately you know it's difficult right um, often this injury occurs because of environmental conditions that occur after application and are such that you can't control them and so I know it's maybe not a uh, satisfying answer but but the answer may just be that when you use this combination of herbicides you're going to see injury what you hope for in situations like this is that the value that these herbicides bring in terms of clean fields outweigh the risk of, of crop injury. And the only way to look at that, to, to evaluate that is to look at kind of long-term yield data. So let's take a look at that. Looking back at the last decade of trial data, you could have a group 14 and 15 tank mix that had higher levels of crop injury on any given year, but also provided exceptional weed control. This would result in soybean yields that were more than double the unsprayed control and equivalent to the herbicide programs that might have had better crop safety, but were less effective at killing weeds. However, if crop injury was observed and there was also poor weed control, then those two stresses could lower yields when compared to herbicides with the same level of weed control, but were less injurious. Hey, great stuff, Mike. Awesome. I, I love that uh, looking inside the, the canopy. Hey, we got a question here from Brianne Tideman. Are there any issues in soybeans with dicamba injury in Ontario like what we've seen in the U.S. Uh, comparatively? Yeah, so if Brianne's question is, do we see dicamba drift in Ontario? You know, the answer to that is yes. I think um, largely we've probably not seen it to the same extent, um, mainly because we have environmental conditions that are not as, as favorable for, for volatility as, as perhaps uh, the southern U.S., but, but certainly it is something that occurs every year. Um, but, you know, the, the industry as a whole has, has made pretty good strides in terms of, of providing tools that help mitigate, mitigate spraying and less than ideal conditions. You know, there's, there's uh, weather app, uh, spray app tools to help 
you know, avoid inversions to identify conditions that are conducive to off-target drift. So yeah, I'm not going to bury my head in the sand and say that it doesn't happen. It happens and um, we need to mitigate it, but not, I don't think to the same extent. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned in the video, uh, soils with lower organic matter and that are coarser should be avoided. Um, but we all can't, you know, you, some of us have soil with <laughs> lower organic matter. So then what do I do? I was kind of waiting for the what if in that. Uh, yeah. What do I yeah. do? Yeah, reflectively, I look at that clip and say, uh, yeah, I more or less said tough luck. Um, <laughs> I think one important thing that I, I didn't mention is that uh, planting depth uh, matters a lot for some herbicides. And in this particular case, you know, the label does specify a planting depth of four centimeters, about an inch and a half deep. And, and the whole idea behind that is, is that you keep that embodied seed and the developing radical and hypocotyl out of the active herbicide layer. So it's a, it's a level of protection. Yeah, ultimately, uh, there are soil type restrictions on label that, that take you out of that game, right, with certain products. Although in Peter's clip, he, I mean, there are options that one could use um, on soils that are low in organic matter and coarse. Like one of the set up soil applied treatments in his water hemp trials is boundary liquid. That doesn't have the same restrictions that, that other herbicides do. So there are options. Um, you're just a lot more limited. Yeah, it, and I, what I would okay. say, Sean, though, is like, um, I'm, what's been helpful around diagnosing herbicide injury, or at least trying to understand it more, is we're, we're seeing more farmers and more fields with you know, like grid uh, soil sampling versus composite uh, sampling, which is which is very then helpful to identify kind of more accurately the level of risk with with poor soil conditions. Like a composite sample has has some issues in terms of it's only as good as as the composite sample, and it might say that you don't have any uh, organic matter issues, whereas a grid sampling might identify distinct areas in the field where, where you'd have problems. So I think that's one nice advancement in terms of soil sampling that, that helps uh, eliminate the risk a bit more. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, when I watch that, it's almost like a cost of doing business. It's, it's going to happen. And, and the net benefit is still very much positive in, 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 in your favor. Yep. And there's also kind of a generational thing where where we've had like amazing herbicide tolerant technologies that have resulted in zero crop injury and we get used to that and probably some people watching this uh have been around in the 70s and 80s where where you know you weren't killing weeds unless you were injuring soybeans right so uh, there's got to be a balance for sure but it doesn't necessarily mean a reduced yield yeah. Okay. And, and, and one of my questions was, and we have a very short clip here we'll, we'll work in where one of my thoughts was, does the crop catch up or is that gap in size there throughout the growing season? So uh, can we take a look at that? Sure. Okay. Uh, I just got to find it here. Uh, here we go. So this is kind of remarkable. Uh, now these beans, uh, we're several weeks now after application and after the injury, and these beans have made a remarkable recovery. You'll recall this was the most severely affected area, and so there's still some leaf distortion remaining. And these particular plants are, are shorter, but uh, the Majority of plants overall have rebounded very nicely and are the same height as all the other soybeans. So they've rebounded size wise, but I guess the yield loss is really what matters, Mike. That's right. I mean, as my colleague and friend Horace Bonner likes to say, soybeans are the great liars, right? Like just when you think that they've uh, taken a crap kicking and are going to yield nothing, uh, a couple weeks pass and they look amazing. So what's interesting going back there now is, is uh, flowering doesn't seem to be affected. The same amount of flowers exist in that plot versus the, you know, the other treatments and controls. Um, you know, the, the stunting is not obvious anymore. So that gives you, uh, you know, a lot of optimism in terms of, 
of it yielding fine. So that is the challenge sometimes with herbicide injury, especially in soybeans, is you can, you can um, it can be dramatic right away. You have an, uh, you know, a gut instinct to want to try and correct that wrong. And sometimes the best thing is to, to, to go away. And, you know, ignorance is bliss sometimes with the herbicide injury in soybeans. I hear you. Okay, Mike, uh, I'm going to bring back in Peter. I'm going to put, you're going to go back to the green room. We're going to bring you back at the end and we've got more questions for you. Okay. Sure. Okay. So just continuing on, we're going to bring back Peter Sikama. He is back. And, and Peter, this time we're going to talk about flea bane. Uh, quickly before we watch the clip, how, how significant of an issue is flea bane in Ontario? Yeah, so uh, glyphosate-resistant Canada flea bane uh, extends from Essex County in the southwest adjacent to the Michigan border to Glengarry County in the east adjacent to the Quebec border. So for all intents and purposes, it is uh, right across the primary agricultural producing area in uh, southern Ontario. Okay, let's, uh, let's watch clip number three here. Peter Sikama talking about uh, flea bane. If I can find it, there we go. So now I'd like to talk about glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane control in winter wheat. As I mentioned at the previous site, uh, Canada flea bane does not cause as large a yield loss in winter wheat as it does in corn and soybean. In our trials in Ontario, on average, Canada flea bane interference causes a 54% yield loss in corn, 65% in soybean, but only 11% in winter wheat. The range in yield loss is anywhere from 0 to 21% due to Canada flea bane interference. So the reason why you don't have the same yield loss in winter wheat is simply a function of time of emergence. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Canada flea bane can grow either as a winter annual or a summer annual. The, uh, by the cohort that is a winter annual is more competitive with wheat and causes a greater yield loss. However, Canada flea bane that germinates and emerges in the spring is at a competitive disadvantage with the winter wheat and the yield loss is not as great. Now we'll go look at four different herbicide options that Ontario farmers have to manage this weed on their farm. So uh, we just left the check plot in this particular experiment. And historically, I've always said that we had one option in terms of managing glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane in winter wheat, and that was Infinity. So the plot on my right was sprayed with Infinity, and in our trials, the Infinity has given greater than 90% control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane in winter wheat. A new product from Bayer Crop Science is Infinity FX. And in this particular experiment, it looks like Infinity FX has provided a few percent better control than Infinity. So in addition to the two products from Bayer Crop Science, Infinity as well as Infinity FX, which provide greater than 90% control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane and wheat, there are now two products from Corteva. They are Pixero M, as well as Lawn Trell. So the plot that I'm standing in was applied with uh, Pixero M, and you can see near perfect control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane in winter wheat with Pixero M. So the last treatment that I'll present is uh, another herbicide from Corteva. It is uh, Lawn Trell. And uh, Lawn Trell, uh, we evaluated it applied both in the fall as well as in the spring and it has provided near perfect control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane in a winter wheat. So just to uh, summarize, I think Ontario farmers have four good options in terms of managing this weed in winter wheat. They are Infinity as well as Infinity FX from Bayer Crop Science or Pixero M and Lawn Trell from uh, Corteva. Uh, 
great, great stuff there, Peter. So what is the most effect, like what is the best timing of that control? You, you mentioned some of the products, but when, when should I be tackling it? Yeah, so in the uh, experiment that uh, you just had the clip of, uh, those four herbicides were applied both in the fall as well as in, 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 as well as in the spring. And then we had treatments where they were applied both in the fall followed by a spring application. If you're only going to apply the herbicide once, our data would say that you get better efficacy with a spring application than a fall application. And so uh, if you're going to only apply the herbicide once, we would say apply it early in the spring. Okay. So, and, and, and then where do things like... Uh you know, using some cropping strategies, where, where does that come into play? Like does the use of cover crops, is that a strategy to help control something like uh, Canada flaybane? Yes, I think uh, cover, cover crops are a really useful component in terms of managing glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane on Ontario farms. So uh, Francois Tardif had a graduate student work on that, uh, a guy by the name of Van High, and uh, Tego Collette uh, did in my program. I think the best time to incorporate cover crops in a three-year crop rotation of corn, soybean, wheat is after a winter wheat harvest. And in the uh, research that uh, Tega did, there was greater than 95% reduction in the stand of Canada fleabane early in the season in corn the following year. So uh, planting a cover crop after winter wheat, I think is a really useful component in managing glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane in Ontario. So something like cereal rye could really be a, could really, really be a, a, an advantage for you in your control. That's uh, correct. And so uh, there's a number of different options that growers can use. It could be cereal rye. It could be a, a blend of uh, oats and uh, tillage radish. The advantage of oats and tillage radish is they are killed by our harsh winter environment and you don't have to control them in the spring. But uh, yeah, there's a number of different uh, uh, cover crop blends that have been very effective at suppressing Canada fleabane. Why is the yield loss with wheat less? Yeah, I think that's uh, strictly a function of the emergence pattern of uh, Canada fleabane and uh, winter wheat, which is a winter annual crop. And so Canada fleabane, although it can emerge in 11 out of 12 months of the year in Ontario, the only month that it doesn't come up is the month of January. It has two primary uh, emergence periods. It's from August to September in the fall, and then from April to June in the spring. So if you seed winter wheat in September, October, it's going to have a competitive advantage over any flea bean that emerges in the spring. And therefore, uh, you will have a lower yield loss in winter wheat compared to either corn or uh, soybean. Say I've got a, you know, a neighbor in my county, or maybe it's right across the road, that uh, has a flea bean issue. How, how concerned should I be? How far will it travel? Yeah, a really good question. And uh, Canada fleabane seed, for those who are not familiar with it, it's very similar to something like dandelion. Canada fleabane has a very small seed with an attached pappus that aids in uh, wind dispersal. In the studies that have been done over the years, by far the majority of Canada fleabane seed lands within 100 meters of the mother plant. However, there are studies that have shown that Canada fleabane seed can enter the planetary boundary layer and it can move more than 500 kilometers in one dispersal event. So just to put that in context, I, I live in Kent County in southwestern Ontario. You could have Canada fleabane seed released from that mother plant. It could enter the planetary boundary layer and it could land in the Ottawa Valley in one dispersal event. So that's how far it can move uh, potentially in uh, one event. So be concerned, <laughs> is what you're saying. <laughs> uh, I think uh, 
Ontario farmers are going to be dealing with glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane indefinitely into the future because there's Canada flea bane in field border areas along uh, concession roads, uh, side roads, and we will have an indefinite supply of uh, glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane seed going forward into the future and farmers will continue to have to manage this weed. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's bring uh, Mike in here as as well. Give me a second. Okay. Okay, we got Mike Coper back as well. I want to remind everybody, if you do have questions for our guest, uh, based on the topics we discussed here today, I encourage you to enter your comment or your question in the box below, wh whether you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. And, of course, if you are interested in CEU credits, you can uh, go to the URL that you're seeing on the bottom of your screen and uh, sign up there. Um, Peter, this may sound like a really, maybe a, sort of a simple question, but how do I actually know that I have resistance? Um, <laughs> is it just a case of, uh, you know, you need to send away for a test or is it just a visual? How, how do I know? Yeah, I think uh, the best way is if you're, if you're suspicious that you have glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane on your farm, you can send seed to either myself or Francois Tardif and uh, we will screen it in the greenhouse and show uh, conclusively whether or not you have glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane on your farm. I think for all intents and purposes, Sean, if you have uh, flea bane escapes on your farm in Ontario, you may as well make the assumption that it is glyphosate resistant. It is just that widespread that I would expect that it's going to be uh, glyphosate resistant on the vast majority of farms in the province. Okay, I'm going to put a question on the board here that... Uh... So, Go ahead, Mike. Well, just to follow up on that too, like yeah. just from uh, purely walking fields at this time of year, like, uh, or or after herbicide application, like if you're noticing like every other species is controlled except this one, like that, that's usually a tell that uh, something's going on. Um, and Peter, you know, wisely mentioned collecting seed. There are some newer uh, tools in the molecular realm. Um, there's a there's a DNA lab in Guelph called Harvest Genomics that uh, can do relatively quick uh, tests based on plant specimens. So you grab a leaf, you submit it, um, and my colleague Kristen Obeid or, or myself like can can uh, facilitate the cost of that. Um, so that's that's another option for like kind of immediate identification. But like yeah, there's still a lot of species that seed is the best way to collect. Yeah, C Kristen commented there that there are also genetic tests to confirm the G9 resistant flea bane. So um, there you go. She's uh, she's watching as well, Mike. Yeah, that's no, good. Um, okay, let's get to Doug's thought here uh maybe off topic after winter wheat is great uh, to put cover crops but i have problems with perennial sow thistle i hear fall application is the best my best option is just a grass cover crop and apply a broadleaf in the fall to keep cover what are your what are your thoughts guys uh, mike do you want to tackle that one yeah sure um so yeah absolutely i think the the challenge with perennial south thistle, I think, I think you can actually make meaningful reductions in perennial south thistle pressure, but you have to be committed to every year fall applications. And that presents some challenges, especially after corn, uh, much easier to do maybe after soybeans or cereals. So yeah, the, the dilemma there is, is right after wheat harvest, there's going to be a window where annuals start coming up and you want to manage those. Um, but, you know, it's better to manage the perennials later in the season. So one, one approach you could take after the wheat's off is you could, um, you know, you could blend fertilizer, like something like potash with oats, broadcast it on, uh, till it in. That will suppress or, or eliminate some of those annual weeds. You'll get a cover crop there for added suppression of weeds. And then, like, then you can target that fall application into mid to late September, even into October, to tackle the south thistle. Because, because the other thing for south thistles, you want that vegetative leaf growth after harvest, so that you can can get good good product on it. And so, you know, that's the simplest way is after winter wheat. Um, again, after soybeans, there you you know uh, there's a window to do that. 
I think we have to become a little bit more aggressive in figuring out after corn. Like I know, like, so last year, for example, there was a window, corn harvest was early. We could have went as late as mid to, to late November and probably had some success. But yeah, like it's a combination of committed to fall application and then um, selecting the good herbicides in, in corn and cereals that are, that are good on perennial sow thistle. Peter, I want to jump back to the flea bane topic for a second here. Does the does the flea bane go to seed prior to the the wheat harvest? So uh, typically, flea bane seed uh, uh, matures in late August to uh, September in Ontario, and then it's released from that mother plant. So at this time, there would be very little mature uh, glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane seed at the time of winter wheat combining. Okay, for sure. So Sean, the challenge in that then is like, Peter is 100% right, it's not gonna be in flower at, at weed harvest. The challenge will be you've cut it off, it'll branch out. And so it's post harvest, where you have to worry about uh, seed production there. So you have to be on it after, after weed harvest. Right away, yeah, for sure, okay. I uh, want to remind everybody, if you do have a question, please uh, get it in there. We're getting some great ones from uh, the audience. Uh, I also want to make a, a note and make sure I uh, let everybody know that uh, we're going to be releasing new episodes every two weeks here of Ontario Diagnostic Days. We're going to do a couple more live broadcasts like we are here this morning, uh, but we will be putting up our next episode, day number two of Ontario Diagnostic Days, in two weeks uh, from today. And a great job by Bern Tobin of Real Agriculture to uh, shoot a lot of the videos, coordinate, put it together, uh, as well as Jay Strovey from our team uh, that put the uh, the final comp or the final product uh, together from a video production standpoint. So great job by them. I also want to once again mention the sponsors of Ontario Diagnostic Days: the GFO, Agris Co-op, BSF, Baron DeKalb. Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, Mazex, Mosaic Company, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta. Uh, great, great stuff. Uh, P Peter, out in, the, out in the fields this year, what, what would you say are, are there any surprises weed-wise that, uh, that you have seen that have sort of like, huh, okay, I, that makes sense, or they're a little bit different from prior years? So uh, I am surprised in 2021 how much late emerging flea bane we have, as well as water hemp for that matter. It's not totally surprising in that uh, I think it's just a function of the frequent rain events that we've had in Ontario in uh, 2021. And because of those frequent rain events, we've had uh, many more flushes of weeds than what we normally would have. And as a result, some of the soil applied herbicides are not providing full season residual weed control like they would have in other growing seasons. Mike, do you have any thoughts? Uh, what, what's kind of caught your eye in terms of what's happened inside this 2021 growing season from a weed perspective? Yeah, so I guess I tend to focus on immediately what's going on. And, and as uh, winter wheat's being harvested across the province, there's kind of three uh, grassy weeds poking above the canopy that um, that I think we need to, to make note of and and formulate a bit of a plan because they're at that stage now of being a nuisance, but a nuisance quickly becomes a problem. So I'm seeing things like Italian or annual ryegrass in winter wheat. And so Peter has experience with that species. And then a number of different bluegrass species. And then lastly, a chess or cheatgrass, which is a winter annual brome species. And so um, the, the, you know, things like bluegrass and Italian ryegrass, those are things that um, could become problematic in other crops like corn and soybeans. So I think, you know, it's a good opportunity to identify those in cereal fields and, and develop a plan to, for the rotational crops to deal with it. What are the control mechanisms? Yeah, so, well, let, why don't we start with Peter on the Italian ryegrass front, uh, since he's, he's done some work on that. Um, what, what, what's your kind of approach there, Peter? So the first comment I would make is that uh, annual ryegrass is super hard to uh, kill in the spring. 
And uh, as a result, I think many farmers have uh, moved away from annual ryegrass simply because it's so hard to get consistent control in the spring. Having said that, uh, the very first work we did is we looked at tank mixes of glyphosate with the group one herbicides, things like Post, Select, Venture, and Assure. And in our uh, research, the uh, control was improved with the addition of the group one herbicide to uh, glyphosate, but it was still not uh, perfect. Really interesting to me, so we moved on from the group one herbicides, and then we looked at tank mixes of glyphosate with the group two herbicides, things like uh, Elim or Prism, uh, Accent, Ultimate, Option. And in our work, uh, any uh, group two herbicide that had rim sulfuron in it, so Ultim or Prism, uh, tank mix with glyphosate had, you know, 95% plus control. And uh, we published both of those uh, studies. And then we moved on and said, well, a farmer really likes to get uh, control of his annual ryegrass and then full season residual uh, weed control. So can you tank mix uh, your glyphosate with a soil applied residual herbicide in corn and get uh, full season uh, residual control? Uh, really interesting to me, the uh, two tank mixes that looked really promising were uh, glyphosate plus integrity and glyphosate plus on guard. And so uh, glyphosate plus on guard, I think is the number one program and it is because it has rim sulfuron in the uh, mix. And so you get control of your annual rye grass and then uh, full season, let's say residual control of common annual grass and broadleaf weeds. You know, Mike, as I hear Peter describe the strategies and you kind of look back on some of the stuff we've talked about today, we've l completely left the era of weed control being simple, <laughs> you know, where it's, you know, just sort of uh, apply a product and it, it, it takes care of the issue. Uh, maybe that's kind of what got us into a little bit of these issues today, but it really does require you to have a firm understanding of all the different permutations and combinations, given the situations and the, what, what's in front of you out in your field it does require a lot of thinking when it comes to weed control now. Well, I would say it was um, tough selling to undergraduate students during the 2000s, the importance of being able to identify green foxtail versus yellow foxtail uh, when glyphosate would kill both very easily. Thank you very much. So uh, you kind of had the telltales at a school to get them to, to be interested in that. Uh, but now we're seeing like, well, I just mentioned bluegrass. There's an, there's an example where there's multiple species and depending on the species, uh, different herbicides work better than others, right? So it goes back to now identification becoming important again, if you want to maximize control. So yeah, I mean, I'm always going to find weed identification interesting, but uh, so I'm somewhat happy about it, but, but uh, from a management perspective, it's not, it's not great. And we don't have black grass like they do in the UK because we growers no. in the UK just like that black grass is their nemesis. We don't have that here, do we? No. And so again, like thinking back to chess and bluegrass, like really the it the reason it's important to identify it now is because the the control options are largely either in winter wheat in the previous fall or the very early part of the spring, and we're just not used to 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 utilizing those two application timings where we're typically more kind of, you know, uh, mid, mid spring. So it's, and, and delays in application really reduce control. So that's why it's important to make note of it now for the next time that fields in wheat uh, as an example. Okay. Uh, Peter is water hemp the, the weed that uh, you think growers struggle the most, but is that like the, one of the biggest challenges, uh, for the, on the grower's acre, or is there one that, because in the U.S., of course, it's always about Palmer amaranth. What, what's Ontario's version of that? So Ontario's version of that would be multiple herbicide-resistant water hemp, so you're quite right. I think, though, that uh, glyphosate-resistant Canada fleabane, based on the research that we've done to date, it is more difficult to get consistent control of fleabane and soybean than it would be in terms of getting consistent control of water, hemp, and soybean or corn. I find that uh, fleabane is, is a, a continuing challenge 
for Ontario farmers. Yeah, and you know what? What I found interesting in the the water hemp video was you showed fierce. I believe was the one of the last plots we looked at, and it just showcased like here's a product that is effective, and if you the, if the the conditions aren't right, we just don't get that moisture. Um, it just it can't do its job, right? So it's not fierce's. It's in th- in this example, it's not the herbicide's fault. It's we can just blame Mother Nature, and she's easy to blame because we blame her for a lot of things. But in this case, it's it's her fault again. You're completely right. Uh, in our research, uh, Fierce is the best uh, setup program in terms of managing water hemp in soybean. However, if you don't get a rain event to, to activate that herbicide, the control can be very disappointing. This year, we happen to have three sites where we're doing research on water hemp, one in Essex County, one in Lambton, and one in Middlesex. We had near perfect control with Fierce in Essex County and Lambton County, and really disappointing control in Middlesex, and it was all related to weather. Yeah. Mike, you have some thoughts on that? Well, I, I have a question for Peter on this. So if in some of those high density environments of water hemp, if I'm debating um, to grow IP soybeans or herbicide tolerant soybeans based on your experience and all the work that you've done, you know, which one of those provides the least amount of risk to management or where, where would you where would you go if you were faced with that decision? Yeah, thanks for uh, putting me on the spot, Mike, but that's a really, uh, really good question. And so farmers have a lot of options now, right? Uh, you can grow IP Roundup Ready, you can grow Extend, Extend Flex, and E3 Soybean in Ontario. And so there are a lot of options in terms of uh, managing water hemp. I will say at the outset that I am reluctant to put on a late post application of dicamba in extend or extend flex soybean. I've just simply walked too many fields where there's been uh, off target movement of dicamba. So I think a late application of dicamba to manage water hemp, I think is kind of off the table. So that means uh, you're looking at either reflex, which I think is better than blazer as your post control and you can use that in any soybean. Then you have Enlist One, which can use an E3 soybean, or you can use uh, Liberty in uh, Extend Flex or E3 soybean. And in the work that we've done, I think that Enlist One will give you 5% better control than Liberty as a post cleanup option. And so I do think that Enlist One is probably the most efficacious but if you happen to have a vineyard next to your soybean field, I'm thinking you're not going to want to use 240 post emergence. And then I think if in a low density environment and assuming your soil applied herbicide gave you, you know, a degree of control, uh, Liberty in our trials uh, in a two pass program seems to work very well. So there's another way to look at that. Um, So for E3 soybeans, you would have three options for for control of escapes, reflex, liberty, 240 choline, whereas in IP soybeans, you really would only have one option uh, to deal with escapes. Is that fair? That's fair. And uh, in the work that we've done, Mike, uh, I think reflex is slightly better than blazer, which kind of surprises me. I always think of blazer as the hotter herbicide. But on water hemp in our trials, where we have had them side by side, reflex appears to be slightly better than blazer. Hmm. Interesting stuff. Peter, do you, you know, Mike's been grilling you with questions. Peter, Peter, do you have a question for Mike? <laughs> I do not, but I will say that I really liked his uh, presentation this morning. I thought it was really, really well done. So kudos to you, Mike, for putting that together over, you know, a four or six week period. I, I thought it was really well done. And the uh, symptomology that Mike showed in his uh, video clips, uh, I think are really consistent with what we've seen in our trials here in Southwestern Ontario. Really well done. Yeah. And, and Mike, when we are diagnosing that herbicide injury, what is herbicide injury confused with? Like if I'm, I go to the field, I'm like, 
Uh, I think it's herbicide injury. Actually, no, it really it's the you know it's this other thing. I, is there the other thing, or is it pretty easy to 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 diagnose? So I think I'll leave with this point. Like I, I think it's worthwhile spending time documenting the full story of a herbicide injury scenario, whether you're a farmer or an agronomist, uh, because uh, I can guarantee you that the same situation will come up sometime in your career. It might not be next year, but it it'll happen. And and collecting that knowledge will will pay dividends the next time it comes around in terms of what to do next. So as as a general rule of thumb, what I like to do, because you're right, like there are like leaf distortion is not unique to herbicide, like herbicide doesn't claim that, Uh, you know, it could be viruses. um, And then later in the season, it could be uh, leaf feeding insects. So you know, it is important to spend the time to to take plant samples from both affected and unaffected plants to look at, to do a viral scan, to do a scan of diseases, to do um, leaf um, fertility tests, just so that you can can compare and rule out whether that was a factor or not. And in that particular case, when we did a viral and disease scan, like nothing came up, right? So we could at least, um, you know, rule those things out. And of course, some soybean varieties have leaf distortion. They just, it's a phenotypic response and it, whether they've been sprayed or not, right? So yeah, there's lots to, to catalog, but if you spend the time doing it, you do look smart two or three years down the road when it inevitably comes up again. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Mike, want to thank you for uh, your clip as well as your insight today. Fantastic stuff. Thanks a lot. And we'll uh, check in with you later. Perfect. And Peter, always great to chat with you and, and get your thoughts on some of the research that you've been doing. Thank you so much for joining us here today on Ontario Diagnostic Days. Hey, you're most welcome. I enjoy it. Yeah, great stuff. Hey, I want to remind everybody, like I said earlier, we are going to be publishing new episodes every two weeks. Uh, and then we are going to be doing a lot. I think in week number, the third episode is another live and the last one will be live. So we'll continue to do this uh, throughout uh, the next several weeks. Looking forward to it. And I appreciate your participation today. If you are interested in CU credits, you can see the link below. Please go to that URL and uh, take care of that. And once again, thank you to all of our sponsors for participating in Ontario Diagnostic Days. And it was great to put the agronomists and diagnostic days together here for you here this morning. Agronomists is every Monday night, usually at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 o'clock Mountain. So check that out if you uh, do so or if you are so inclined. Uh, On behalf of everybody, uh, on our sponsors, participants today uh, and Real Agriculture, I want to thank all of you for joining us and uh, cheers, everybody. (laughs) 